Good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, my name is George Monti. It's a pleasure to uh, moderate this panel with uh, three distinguished uh, colleagues from three different parts of the world who will talk to us a little bit about fairness in digital regulation in their jurisdiction. I just wanted to open with a few general remarks about the notion of fairness and trying to pin it down. In particular, perhaps try to respond to some of the criticisms that have been made before that fairness is this unruly horse that cannot be governed effectively. In the law of contract, we are fairly well used to thinking about fairness, so perhaps that's a good place to start. And if you look at the law of contract generally, you see that fairness is something which the law protects most more or less indirectly. So the notion of freedom of contract is expected to deliver fair results. And what we do with regulation is we regulate markets so that freedom of contract prevails. So the P2B regulation that was discussed a bit earlier in the conference is about facilitating bargaining by creating more transparency. I know the terms of the contract I'm bargaining. Anti-discrimination law creates equal opportunities. Uh, rules on inequality of bargaining power, uh, again, address a situation where although it appears that two parties have voluntarily entered into a contract, one has a much significantly high, uh, greater bargaining power than the other. In this context, perhaps given that this is a global uh, comparative analysis, you might observe that civil law countries are much more protective of parties who are of unequal bargaining power than the common law countries, which assume more equality of bargaining. So there are some different assumptions, different jurisdictions around the world make about the contractual powers of two parties to contracts with the civil law countries being more protected. So we protect fairness indirectly, and uh, but we also sometimes protect it directly. But when we do so in contract law, we find that normally this is done by rules rather than standards. So the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive has a blacklist of things that are prohibited. The Data Act has a gray list of things that may be indicatively be unfair. And there is no efficiency defense. And nobody complains that there is no efficiency defense. There are rules to which there are no exceptions. Only very rarely does the law of contract allow judges to determine fairness themselves. And when they do so, I think it is interesting to perhaps compare the concept of fairness that you find in the Digital Markets Act in 2023 with the concept of fairness that you find in the Unfair Terms and Consumer Contracts Directive, because the wording is rather similar. So the Unfair Terms and Consumer Contract Directive, you can see it there, suggests that a term is unfair if, contrary to the requirements of good faith, it causes a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations. The DMA also speaks about an imbalance between rights and obligations, and proportionality is very similar to significance. So the legislator might have gone back 20 years or 30 years uh, to the Unfair Contract Terms Directive to think about the concept of, of fairness. So perhaps not such an innovative concept, and uh, the Commission has also published recently a set of guidelines to explain how different courts in different European jurisdictions have worked out what fairness means under uh, contract law. So perhaps fairness is, is a little bit more well-grounded in the European uh, debates than we think. A um, couple of things about fairness in contract law and the reason I went to contracts, I let my colleagues uh, who are experts uh, speak to, to the digital regulation, is that fairness is protected in contracts without complicated cost-benefit analysis to minimize type one errors. We recognize that one party is weaker than the other and that that party deserves protection. It's not the, based on complicated utilitarian calculuses. If anything, and this is a response to Nicolas Petit's point that he made earlier in the conversation today, fairness is not individualized in contract law. Uh, the consumer is expected to be reasonably circumspect and reasonably careful. So when Constantina before said, yeah, we give the consumer opportunities, but will the consumer take these opportunities on board? This is a recurrent criticism of EU contract law that it assumes that the individual is sufficiently rational to take advantage of transparent terms, but that is not always the case. So we do have also in contract law a little bit of uh, risk of, of type two errors emerging in the legal order, which is also a little bit the motivation for the DMA in the first place, a concern that uh, competition enforcement, even though it is possible if one was adventurous enough to make it work effectively, there is a policy concern that perhaps we have too much of, uh, of under enforcement, we need to be more robust. Now, rather than looking at the DMA, we're gonna look at uh, jurisdictions around the world. So I have with me uh, in the room, uh, Professor Ole Sandrichuk from Newcastle University, and he'll talk mostly about the UK experiences. Uh, and then online, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see the screen. I have uh, Professor Masako Wakui from uh, Kyoto University where she's a professor of law and she specializes in competition law and economic regulation. 
And then uh, we have Professor Fiona Scott Morton, who is the Theodore Nierberger Professor of Economics at the Yale School of Management, who joins us from Scotland, so not so many time zones away. Welcome to the three of you. So we're going to do this by me asking the three panel members a few questions and then get some discussions between them. And if you have any comments or questions, just raise your flag. Or if you're on the Zoom, just put a comment in the chat and I'll try and pick up your question as we go along. So perhaps we start with trying to see what is going on in these different jurisdictions and then ask each of you, and I'll start with Masako with this first question, what kind of digital market regulation uh, we see in your jurisdiction that includes the concept of fairness? Oh, so it's not Ores, it's me. Oh, sorry. Yes, you're <laughs> right. Uh, sorry, I, I'm, I don't have my glasses. I can't see if I... Yeah, Ores, you start. Thanks. Thank you very much, Giorgio. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to participate in this event. It's really a remarkable uh, forum and it generated so many insightful ideas. Uh, it's it's a little bit you know, sad for me still to, to, to look at the UK as the rest of the world category, but it's unavoidable, unfortunately. And it's, we can do this genuine regulatory experiment, experimentalism. And because UK, as, as many of you know, have uh, we have their our own digital markets act so to say it's still at the stage of parliamentary discussions uh, it's it's called digital markets competition and consumers bill bill and it's not very long it's only 380 something pages and most of them are not relevant directly to competition to digital markets there are other uh, parts which are more relevant to consumers i will obviously focus uh, on the elements relevant to digital markets. So it's kind of a, a second version of the DMA with some really remarkable similarities because it's been inspired by the same ethos, yeah, same people, Furman Report and uh, all the rest of it. But it has, juristically, it has several paradigmatic differences. And the first one is directly re related to fairness. We also have quasi division between fairness and contestability. Uh, two different parts of the uh, of the bill regulate fairness and contestability pr proto contestability relations in in UK parlance we are, we are talking when we talk about fairness we talk about conduct requirements and we talk about contestability we're talking about pro competition interventions so speaking of fairness it's really interesting how the how the uh, legislators have drafted the bill First of all, we didn't have a chance to have a look at the bill before it has been released to the parliament. So we didn't have this nine months. Remember when the DMA was released, everybody was you know, wasting their Christmas time, reading every letter of DMA, trying to visualize. We didn't have it. We have many discussions about first order things, about the, the objectives, but we didn't have the bill at hand. We only had access to the bill once it has been released by the minister or by the Department for Business and Trade to the parliament. So Department for Business and Trade, not the commission drafting the rules for itself, but, but ministerial department drafting the rules for the CMA. That's another important difference. Now, what's the substance of the rules? We have, when we hear, when we upload, and those who are on pro-enforcement side do upload to the originality of the DMA in sense of the all-inclusiveness, obligations susceptible of being further specified. It's not that we didn't have time to specify them. We do it on purpose, yeah? But it's nothing in comparison to the discretionary um, uh, discretionary competences which are being assigned to the CMA by the bill. Not only the CMA is expected to further specify obligations, it has the privilege to tailor, to design obligations which help to achieve the goals of fairness. So the... The sky is the limit, pretty much. And it's, you know, on normative side, I think that's the only way to, to play this game meaningfully, contrary to, to, to other colleagues who are more skeptical. We either play this game in this very, very risky terms, or we don't, we, we don't have to play it at all, because otherwise it will be, you know, delayed, delayed, delayed ad, ad infinitum. Another stark example or difference, we have efficiency defense. We have efficiency defense, section 29, uh, which uh, the, in, in UK parlance called contravening benefits example, uh, exemption. Furthermore, my English 
allows me to hypothesize that this is it's mandatory. I don't know, maybe other colleagues who know the bill. No. The, 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 the vocabulary suggests that it's a mandatory efficiency defense. So if the designated undertaking called USM undertakings with strategic market status have do present to the CMA appealing, convincing reasons, uh, arguments, evidence why this, the, the designated activity or tailored specific conduct uh, requirement has to be exempted, the CMA is obliged to exempt uh, a, a condition. Two last points, if I have done. The last, or the, another interesting point, novella, we don't have it in, in, the, in the European Union DMA at least. Uh, I think it was copied from, uh, or maybe inspired by the Australian media bargaining code stuff. We have uh, the mechanism of final offer, which could potentially um, uh, speed up the process of, of rent terms. So it's similar, similar arbitrary binary op option for the CMA to say which offer is more appealing and it's yes or no, which is supposedly, it's not micromanagerial price setting, but it's uh, quite interventionist in, in, its, in its nature. <laughs> the last specificity, or not specific, but feature which is quite interesting to note is the level and the, the parliamentary discussion tells us that it was one of the hottest issues in the uh, in, is currently one of the hottest issues is the level of judicial scrutiny in uk we have two standards so to say we have very light touch and i say very light, light touch uh, probably i withdraw this not very light touch but in comparison to the to the next stage a judicial review jr standard and we have full merits review so the proposal is expected, to, and because uh, judicial review light touch, light touch standard is applicable to the decisions of administrative authorities. So you're not expected to challenge the nitty gritty of the case if it's done by the, the, the administrative authority, but it's still quite intense in terms of the level of details um, which can be scrutinized by, by the judicial. Full merits review as, as the very uh, label suggests is much more deeper uh, fact specific type. Currently, it's a big discussion which standard to opt into because both, um, how to say, it, not both, though all stakeholders have quite appealing uh, arguments in, in in support and in in support of their position and criticizing the position of of their vis a vis. I I have some normative comments on the substance of these rules, but I will reserve it for this for the next uh, installment of the conversation. Okay, thanks. So fairness is about good conduct. Um, Masako, can you tell us a little bit about Japan? Yes, thank you. Um, I, well, first of all, I'm sorry that I can't not be there. Then fairness is highly contextual concept. So then I, because I couldn't be there with you. Uh, so I may be saying something that is totally alien to you or, or there is some, I think a war. Uh, atmosphere. I may be back to being far east and outside. The, um, so um, I'm sorry in advance, but let me try. Um, uh, so, so like this uh, regulation uh, um, in Japan uh, starts with the competition law in Japan, which is called the Anti-Monopoly Act and the AMA, which covers the law. So to the extent that we discussed that we don't need anything to address digital platforms because we, we have so many tools. Uh, but in the end, after all, we are, we'll have it. But let me express, um, explain it, let me outline the AMA, Japan's Competition Law, which was enacted in 1947 during the post-war U.S. occupation of Japan and drafted by the uh, U.S. expert back then. And they set the goal as to promote fair and free competition. And this fair word has been taken so very seriously in Japan. For example, what the AMA regulate a private mon monopolization? Uh, uh, well, this is a, basically a copy of monopolization uh, covered by Section 2 of Sherman Act. And it differs from the EU abuse of dominant position. And then this private monopolization is found only where the company uses the method, which is not within legitimate 
or normal means of competition corresponding to the US monopolization element that willful acquisition or maintenance of that power as distinguished from growth of development as a consequence of super uh, uh, products, business acumen of or historic accident. So I can say that this relates to the fairness concept, in fact, in Japan. At, at least it, we relate to it. Um, acquiring the monopoly power not based on the merits is unfair. So this means that there's always a sort of unfairness uh, behind the enforcement of the AMA provisions, which are similar to the US uh, monopolization or the minor or pre preventa preventative versions of, of them. And in relation to the digital sector, such cases include Apple, so already it's there, right? Airbnb and booking.com and Amazon. Then furthermore, the AMA also prohibits the business employing the unfair method of competition. So originally model in the US, FTC section five, or for which one does not establish, does not have to, prove any sort of, any kind of power. So this applied to the very first digital case in Japan, DNA 2011 with, by the FTC. Then additionally, <laughs> around the time when the US ended occupation of Japan, Japan introduced then back then like novel regulation called regulation of superior, uh, regulation of abuse of superior bargaining position. SVP in 1953. I see increasing roles for the SVP regulation in Japan in digital sector, and the case include Amazon, which hosts sellers to pay fees and money for services which had no or little uh, value to the sellers. Then outside, although like this, AMA does a lot uh, in Japan, but it's not, there's not, or they still, um, the government decided to legislate further. So outside the AMA, there's already the act on improving transparency and the fairness of digital platforms, widely known as Transparency Act. So, um, and its, it's stated goal is again to promote fair and free competition. And the regulator, the Ministry of Economy, is particularly watching the unjustified suspension of account or delisting and trying to ensure transparency. And the Japan is likely to have another legislation in relation to Google, Google and Apple's smartphone ecosystem, uh, which would be similar to the DMA, but I think I will stop here. Thank you. Right. So fairness begins from 1947 and moves onwards as a central plank of uh, economic regulation. So well-established, perhaps in the United States, less so, Fiona? Yes, the US, I think, is quite different um, from these other jurisdictions and particularly quite different from Europe. Uh, the term fairness in the US, as far as I understand it, is used really exclusively in conjunction with end consumers and issues like discrimination and um, other element, uh, other settings where there is a relatively large and well-informed business on one side and a relatively small and less informed and less powerful consumer on the other side. And I think it's the case, I would be interested to hear from anyone listening who has a different view, that there is no competition statute employing fairness or unfairness that has been upheld by a court to mean anything other than the same thing as the Sherman Act. So for example, uh, the Department of Agriculture enforces the Packers and Stockyards Act. There's some fairness terms in that. Uh, that has been attempted to be brought to court and courts have not upheld the unfair part of that. Similarly, courts and commentators have not been able to agree for decades on what unfair methods of competition in the FTC Act is supposed to mean. Existing jurisprudence really just doesn't add anything beyond the requirements in the Sherman Act. Now, this, of course, varies over time with, with whoever's leading the agencies. Um, what is an unfair method of competition? I would say those on the left think it goes well beyond the Sherman Act. The center does not. 
Uh, we had a statement explaining that the FTC Act was the same as the Sherman Act for some years. That was withdrawn by the Biden administration, and there's a new and expansive statement on what unfairness means, uh, which I encourage everybody to read. It's uh, it's beautifully written and long, but it's aspirational. I mean, that's it's just something the FTC has said. It's not hasn't been brought to court, hasn't been tested, no courts endorsed it. It's just a, an expression of what uh, current leadership uh, believes. I would say, in general, U.S. courts seem rather averse to allowing an economic relationship between businesses to be unfair. And I think this goes back to what you said earlier, Giorgio, about if there is competition and we have well-informed parties on both sides, then competition should generate something that counts as fair. So therefore, uh, we don't need fairness when it comes to dealings between businesses. And that's where the competition enforcement shows up. There are plenty of rules prohibiting businesses from being unfair to consumers, like discrimination on the basis of race, religion, sex, national origin. We have some laws against marking up water in an emergency or snow shovels in a storm. Um, but again, these are about uh, fairness with regard to end consumers. So uh, the business fairness is really not part of the law, despite some legislative efforts using that word. And I think this makes sense in a narrow way. Um, unfairness between businesses concerns the division of surplus or profit between them. It's about the functioning of the free market, which is very deep in US ethos of how we should do regulation. If both parties are obeying the law, thinking ahead, being diligent about being informed, then you should not end up with any unfair situations. This should be very rare. Of course, this has as a baseline a requirement that the competition laws are enforced well so that we don't have one party with a lot of market power. But in general, we're going to see um, unfairness sometimes because sometimes a firm has bad luck, something unexpected occurs, an earthquake, a demand shock, a pandemic, uh, and then that firm could be exploited by another firm. And I think the bottom line in the US is we don't really have a law. We've decided it's not worth having laws that explicitly deal with those what are assumed to be rare events. Uh, and then it's hard to think about what rule you would make to improve on non-rare events that would make the division of surplus do something more favorable. And we can come back to that a bit later, but um, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Okay, thanks very much. Maybe I'll just come back to uh, a couple of you with some follow-up questions on, on the points you've made. Uh, Oles, just on, uh, you talked a little bit about this final offer for Fran. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on when this applies and which kind of reg situations is designed to govern? Mm -hmm. Thank, thank, thank you, Giorgio. My understanding is that this provision is applicable to uh, Chapter 3 aspects of the DMCC, and namely to conduct requirements. So if uh, the, the parties try to, if the, the, the specific conduct, i.e. obligation, which we don't know what, what will be the substance of, yeah? unlike DMA, we have the list, vague, disputable, but we know what we're talking about. Here, we only have a benchmarks which indicate what the ob objectives would facilitate to achieve or prevent to, 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 to exist. And if the elements of rent will be re relevant or some elements of, of price will be at stake, without to, to striking the delicate balance or finding the path between Silla and Haribla, you, you want to speed up the process and you probably uh, want to, to, to your, your motivation is similar to what the Australian bargain, media bargaining court ha, ha, and, envisages and Canadian, I think as well. And uh, it's still the bill. So uh, we will have the opportunity for both sides to submit their vision of what the reasonable, fair, reasonable price is. And then this final offer mechanism arbitrates the, 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 winner, the winning part. Thanks. Yeah, but it's much more broad in application than the Australian bargaining code, which is just about one discrete transaction between two parties, whereas this is potentially quite widely yeah. applicable. Yeah, thanks. And Masako, just maybe a little bit more to push you a bit on, on what 
is meant by fairness in Japan. I mean, you know, as you said, the AMA start talks about competition and fairness. So one of the points that we discussed in previous panels is, is fairness a standalone concept that does some work? Or is fairness basically something which is so closely related to competition? So at the beginning of your intervention, you spoke a little bit about competition on the merits and right, conduct is unfair if it's not competition on the merits. Well, in the EU parlance, we would say conduct is anti-competitive if it's not competition on the merits. So does fairness add anything to the application of competition law or economic regulation in Japan? Well, if you exclude the anti-competitive part from the fairness concept, as a second, then what would remain would be, uh, well, the, the the division of the surplus, and also like retrospective changes to the uh, contract, and um, the when it comes to the first one, like division of surplus, the and Japan has been also careful, but uh, not that hesitant. Um, it um another AMA and the competition regulator JFTC Japan Fair Trade Commission. It's like it was like never do like no never be price regulator. That was a catchword like motto for them like for a long time. But they I think I think they are changing. But I see a little bit of change of the attitude and they, then and another thing is like the um um yeah so then retrospective change and unilateral. Change, well, the retrospective and unilateral changes that would remain. And uh, here we don't. I think the Japan. The, what what makes the difference between the um between the U.S. and the Japan? Japan does not assume that business people are smart enough to. <laughs> so there are people right, small and also judicial um judiciary doesn't work like the U.S. There is no travel damage system. So access to justice is still, and there is a greater, uh, I don't know, because I've never lived in the US, because, but we concern the fear factor, revenge and reputation that someone sues someone like a trading partner, you would lose the whole business. So the a contract and system law doesn't work as ex expected. So that's the kind of, I think the uh, two things that, um, I can think of there may be more about. But no, but this is useful because in a sense, there are some fundamental assumptions that we make about how markets work and how people work within the markets that maybe shape the regulatory framework. Um, so going back to Fiona, so perhaps, although fairness isn't uh, embedded, I mean, it's an aspiration, as you said, in the latest FTC guidelines, but uh, public interest is perhaps a more useful concept in the US and how does that play out? Yes, I think that's right. When we have goals that we want to achieve that are not about profit maximization and not, we think can't just be left to firms to organize amongst themselves in a let's hope properly functioning market. We often use words in the United States that are more like the public interest. So what, what would that mean? Well, you could, you could think about media plurality, you could think about the health of the farming community, you could think about um, something to do with the environment, all of these things would count as something in the public interest, um, particularly if when Congress wrote the statute, they described the kinds of goals that they were interested in. Um, one that is, I think, to, to my mind, particularly important for this discussion because it relates to what maybe other jurisdictions would think about fairness in an economic context is the incentive to invest and protection from being expropriated. So let's imagine that I have invested in some kind of handset and now there is a patent uh, patenting entity that's gonna come and say, I'd like all of your profits in order for you to have access to a single standard essential patent, which you must have in order to run your business. Well, that's a kind of expropriation of surplus that the parties would not have invested the way they did if they had could have foreseen that that would occur. And fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory uh, is, is meant, I think, to capture that. And so you could go to a court and, and think about fair in that context. Of course, in the United States, we say RAND, reasonable and non-discriminatory. We get rid of fair because we don't seem to like, as I said, this word fair between firms. But I think the way I would interpret fair as an economist 
is if we want our market economy to work well and everybody to invest properly and get the returns that are deserved of correct investment and and that was planned and and maybe then there is an unplanned thing like the law changes or the patent assertion entity appears you want to not disincentive not to disincentivize that investment and you want to give the returns that were appropriate to the setting and that's where i think a, an idea of in the public interest can substitute for fair because it is in the public interest that all the parties that invested should get a rate of return commensurate with their investment in under the circumstances that caused them to invest that were that were reasonable and so forth. So that's the way in which you could make a link uh, between the two. I would say these other um, other elements of in the public interest that are not about splitting the surplus would really be about topics like uh, a vibrant farming community, media plurality, uh, environmental harms of some sort, and so on. But those, of course, are a little, uh, um, Congress could write specific statutes about them. And so by using, by capturing them under in the public interest, you really need the the statute that has the public interest in it to give some instruction to the agency about what that means and the the goals that the agency is supposed to pursue. And that is particularly relevant today in the United States where we have the Supreme Court trying to dismantle the administrative state and remove Chevron deference and say, if they don't like it, it becomes a major question and then the agency doesn't have the right to do anything. Um, and that is going to put a heavy burden on Congress to be writing very explicit instructions to agencies about what to do. And that's going to yet further take us away from expressions like fairness or public interest and down a path of, well, I want this, I'm Congress and I want an agency to ensure there are three or more providers of media services in each geographic market or something like that um, that's just very explicit and cannot be challenged by a court as being not explicit. Thanks. I mean, lots of food for thought there, uh, just in terms of, of the legal mandate, but also your definition of fairness, which is kind of more consequentialist, because it's it's a bit of fairness as a general welfare enhancement uh, device because it's not just redistributing resources from A to B but also making sure that if B has resources taken away from it that B's incentives are not diminished so it, it's not like in, in contracts where we think about justice we don't care about the incentives we care about more about the bilateral connection so maybe there are two ways of thinking about fairness uh, a more legalistic and economic Masako do you want to respond to this approach to fairness oh well yeah well um I think I guess um I don't know I, I was um I was thinking of the yeah the, about just what you said um this like protecting weaker parties from the retrospective change or unilateral imposition that the burdens as the someone on the counterpart or the weaker party didn't expect it. Um, that it relates to the um for for Japan like related to the autonomy concept or self self determination, and also for the more like uh, democracy, and that was how we conceptualize the, that kind of fairness since nineteen seventy seven. Um, so yeah, that's a one one thing, and another thing is that uh, I don't. It could be the over complication. Um, my attitude towards whole this kind of vague abstract concept is the, uh, what what you would like to catch in using that word. I don't mind the different terminology um, itself, but well, and public interest is the dirty word in Japan that we have to care for right? because the public interest they, was the word that was heavily, uh, very frequently used to before the war or during the war to suppress individual freedom, um, like rights to go to strike and, um, and the public uh, uh, private um, personal um, property rights. Then 
still now, then the U.S. thanks thanks to the U.S. occupation that they live. So pre-war Japan, it was part of the constitution. Public welfare, public interest there was there was everything like overrides every individual freedom and rights. And so and then uh, it's gone, but still, you know, when it comes to the competition, like it the framework, like it very often it's about competition versus public interest, and public interest in this context means that what the protect protectionist um industry policy minded government cares. So we don't like it. So that's the situation then that we have now, like sustainability and all other stuff. So it's it's more complicated. But... Rojo, can I say one more thing? Go on. Um, just your point about how this this idea of redistribution is is an incentive thing and not a fairness thing in the United States. I think that's quite insightful. I would say that it allows for redistributing to the harmed party without making it sound like the harmed party was a little pathetic, couldn't manage things quite right, didn't do a good job negotiating, got caught in a bad situation. Why is the legal system bothering to help them? It's the free market, their managers, they have shareholders who are diversified. Surely everything's okay. If we have occasional mistakes like this and they're not very common. And I think that's where the reasoning of, well, actually that will stop people investing or doing kind of risky things that we want them to do because we've made the environment more uncertain or, or more unfair than it otherwise would be. So it is exactly as you say, but and I feel that the individual firm seeking to have itself protected by the court, this is something that is not, it's a little like Moscow said in the United States, this is the thing that's disfavored just culturally. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and also, I mean, you know, culturally, it's interesting what Masako said about the notion of public interest being a little bit difficult to, to transplant to a legal order where this term had been used in a different way before. Uh, but going back to the other point that Fiona made about sort of the complicated constitutional issue between, you know, the Congress and the regulators. So you delegate to the regulator rulemaking powers, and then you give that regulator a little bit of discretion. And th that also a little bit shapes who is in charge of, of the fairness uh, concept. Is it the Congress or is it the regulator that can elaborate on it. Maybe, Olas, do you want to reflect a little bit upon this in terms of legal mandates and fairness in the UK perspective? Yeah, I, th I think if, if, if you look at the bill and uh, the discussions underpinning the bill, they, I would concur with people who, who crit criticize the concept of fairness as being instrumental. My descriptive point here would be similar. I think it is in, in the, con there are areas of law where where the, 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 the issue is of immediate substantive relevance, fair share, other topics, where you can see the, 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 the disbalance, the market fair. Here, we definitely see it when we talk about intra-platform uh, competition, but I think it's also a, a proxy for a speedier, more, more discretionary enforcement. And in my view, it's not a bag, it's a feature. It's, 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 it's a, a bit of remedy, which is not very pleasant to our liberal democratic vocabulary and minds, but that's the only way to, to bring some, to, to remember one of the iterations of the bill was called explicitly pro-competition intervention. So this pro-competition modality going much farther than this remedial uh, ex post competition policy, which until you identify instance of infringement, you are basically powerless. Here you receive you receive very generous discretionary competences. The the, the mandate of fairness being open ended, being uh, well, uh, you know uh, susceptible to further interpretation more than anything else, is 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 very well selected uh, toolkit to bestow upon the enforcer these competences which are missing so, so far. And then the question is, which is in my view is not being articulated with sufficient depth, what should be the relationship between the enforcer and the government or and the broader socioeconomic agenda, so to say. We are not anymore axio in, the, in the axiomatic enforcement where we rely on the annals of, of, of neoclassical price theory and we match, uh, try to match a conduct with specific price parameters. 
the sky is the limit. The discretion is a new, it's, it's a new modality of enforcement. And it's not, uh, it's been thematized, but rather at marginum, uh, because this topic is, uh, you know, is, is delicate. And it's also not particularly attractive for, 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 for different stakeholders. I wanted also to make um, um, another point, namely uh, that the, if, we, if we have this efficiency defense, a lot would depend whether it will be mandatory or, or discretionary. If we grant the discretion for the, for the, for the competition agency to, to, to accept or reject efficiency defense, then it will be another toolkit for this participatory approach to, to competition policy, policy, which we all praised so much in this new uh, DMA style um, rules. And thus, it will be a, a kind and a collegial, delicate balance between the designated undertakings on one hand and enforcers. And the expectation is not to, to, to turn the, the rifle into machine gun, producing uh, non-compliance non decisions with, you know, the, it's not about penalizing, it's about designing the tool of compliance. Because if you apply creatively all these obligations, and if you extend them with all this, you know, uh, potential hypothetical meaning, you can you can paralyze the markets essentially. And it's not the, the intention of the enforcers. That's why I'm saying that it's not axiomatic, it's discretional, it's ad hoc. That's the only way, but it has to be thematized, I think. Thank you. That's interesting because when you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, when you give an independent body some powers as a state, for example, the central bank, it has a single mandate. And so you can trust it with a technocratic decision because it's rather limited. But as you said, the, here the CMA is ostensibly given very broad powers. And so some ways of controlling that discretion is necessary. And if it's not through the legal system, it's through the enforcement design. Um, interesting. Yeah, maybe we can follow up, but I just wanted to pick up, uh, ask Masako a question, because you started us off with showing how fairness is well embedded into the system, but is it really possible for uh, fairness to be well regulated? So when we talk about the regulatory practice, I mean, you spoke about a few judgments. Are these leading to effective enforcement? Um, well, um, it uh, depends on, uh, on what kind of fairness we are talking about here um but well <laughs> but the, i would say that the i i, I do like the D, dma substan substantial part of the AMA that includes it like, covers that uses the lot of concept about the, the georgia hinted as georgia hinted well the, the, this is actually the word from you, right? A lot of talk of fairness, but less enforcement. That characterized Japanese law in general, not not only in the anti-monopoly act. So beautiful words everywhere, are like in relation to gender equality, workers protection and human rights and everything. But when it comes to enforcement, it's like uh, it's not happening. But I don't think that. This is because Japan likes uses the fairness concept that much very often. And it appears to me that this is more to do with this whole system like institutional design, access to justice, the whole dynamics amongst the stakeholders, like including government, politicians, and citizen consumer businesses and politicians. So I I may not have answered the question, but that's what I can say. <laughs> Yeah, no, but it's relevant because in a sense, what you're saying is that the institutional design kind of drives the, the I mean, you can have beautiful words, but if you don't have a proper execution, so as Oles was saying, you can give the CMA a lot of powers, but you need to make sure that they're kind of well used in order to to achieve results. And, and what you're telling us in Japan, maybe the institutional dimension is a bit missing. Yeah, yes. And well, if I say there is something positive about the JFTC or Japan AMA, like the whole dynamics uh, is that the JFTC is like imposing like self, self restraint on them. Uh, and their, their another motto is that don't border businesses unnecessary. <laughs> no fault. <laughs> they have to win. They have to be sure. So they don't, and also the penalty is very low, minor, if the, you go like, um, like 1% or 10% of the US or EU impose. So it's still, to be, but then using this little tiny cute cuddly tools, what the JFTC does, like raising the awareness, or pointing out here issue, for example, like aftermarket blocking issue, 
But then the after some there are like so, some other regulators start may start working on that, then we may have the legislation. So it likes works like the could be like the market study what the CMA does, everything on, on its own, but JFTC only raise an issue, then other mechanism start kicks start working. Okay, right. Yeah, which maybe raises questions about how other jurisdictions look at the relationship between one agency and other agencies that do related work. Um, before we wrap up, I don't know if there are any comments or questions from the floor or online. Yep. Yeah, go on. Yeah, sorry. Just to clarify one point, um, that when when the start when they started this uh, project with uh, mandatory efficiency defense, I, I was quite explicit saying, guys, it's it's suicidal. If you have mandatory efficiency defense, you will it will be you know it will be endless procedural delays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the response was, don't worry, it's judicial review standard, so they, it's not justiciable actually. It's mandatory, but it's within our discretion now. When last minute the judicial review standard is being changed into full merits review, it's it it it, para, it would paralyze the enforceability. So I don't see it as a, as a, as as equalization. I would say that it's it's too generous reliance on procedural parents. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Audrey. Thank you. I would like to ask a question to Oles, if I may, uh, regarding what you mentioned on the judicial review. How do you foresee the outcome with the DMCC? Do you think that the law would be adopted from your experience you know, and what you know? Thank you. It's it it was in my in my understanding thank you on the on the question it it was quite an extraordinary development because uh, the the head of, of of communication and digital select committee in the House of Lords has written just two days ago a letter to the Prime Minister saying that rumors say that you plan to change in the Parliament the standard of review which is you know that's in itself is already something which you which you raise your which raises your attention. Where it will lead us, nobody knows. But if if these changes can be made like this during the third reading of uh, of the of the bill, um, it questions uh, the the effectiveness of the whole of the whole project. In my view, at least, because uh, then you not only you will have two phases of review within mandatory efficiency defense. You will have to 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 discuss the details in the in the CMA. But then, if you have full merits review. You probably understand it better than, than, than me that it will be, you know, um, we will revert back to exposed rules. To ask a different question, coming back to, to the DMA. As uh, we often listen about, uh, even if today comes with some dent of, about the previous discussion, but anyway, there is always this idea of uh, Europe as a uh, uh, powerful regulator uh, that can uh, affect the world and so on. Now the DMA is low. In a few months, it will be operational. And my simple question is, uh, uh, do you think that this will become, uh, will affect this other jurisdiction at this point, that there will be reaction? Uh, like the GDPR story, I'm not judging it if it's true or not, but there is a GDPR story that says that we have uh, put a standard that the world is following or whatever, uh, or not following, but uh, has to confront with, uh, is something similar could happen with uh, the DMA, both in rhetoric or in reality? So there's a question about the Brussels effect. Uh, let me maybe start with uh, Fiona. Um, that's a great question. I think that if, Let's first suppose that the DMA works exactly the way it's supposed to, and it redistributes platform profits toward business users and end users. Those business users are then going to become accustomed <clears throat> to having that return on that activity. They will invest more, they will innovate more, they will have more, and those business users will go to governments in other jurisdictions and say, this is what we want. This is now normal. This is consistent with our business model. We need it to support our investment in innovation in your jurisdiction also. And I think it will just give 
a different reference point for what we think of as fair or reasonable or non-discriminatory or whatever local words are used uh, because there is an existing distribution and of, of surplus in Europe that looks like that and a set of activities that goes along with with those with with uh, that money. So I it will just make a different picture and benchmark and I think that inevitably will have an impact. Thank you. That's an interesting approach because contrary to the GDPR that Pierluigi mentioned, where it was almost like firms felt compelled to to harmonize here, it's more creating uh, the conditions where you kind of change the economic paradigm. Uh, Masako, what do you think the DMA will have as an effect in the in Japan? Oh my goodness, do I have to answer that question? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> The Japanese government, will hate, Japanese people will hate me what I'm going to say. Uh, that the, the Japan would adopt Kobe and dilute it the, to make it non ineffective. That happens so many times in relation to GDPR, P2B regulation, and also the competition law itself. Um, they copy and create the same registration, but minus penalty. That is what I have to ask. Okay, so we go back to the problem that without penalties, you're not really going to get, get any enforcement. But I guess the UK will hold firm and uh, take the advantages of Brexit and pow power on with this bill and uh, diverge voluntarily from the EU, right? What I wanted to say, thank you, Giorgio, for this. I, I think the, the question rises. Uh, I, 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 I think, Pierluigi, you, you have raised a very important thing, and we were talking about uh, this Brussels effect. So, uh, uh, Anna Brafford, I, I think what, what is really kind of surprising is that in her taxonomy, we have three digital empires. We have kind of entrepreneurial empires on the uh, on the west we have state driven empire on the on the east and we have kind of europe as moral compass uh, proselytizing the world about what is human centric regulation how the human centric regulation should be i i think is it is it kind of a correct taxonomy or maybe we need also to be and this moves me to to, to the question which we were raising in the previous panel maybe we have to be also more pragmatic and consider about more uh, not only this toolkit but also something more digital as well okay i don't may, see may add, yeah go on uh, may, may, may i add something well, we, 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 we know let's see uh, the, the, um, um yeah okay um no, uh, notice that I missed some some, some important point. Japan uh, see the EU, so there is a Brussels effect for sure. But see also the watching also the UK and the US. And okay, now Europe is starting like this, but US is not moving to towards that. So right, <laughs> so that's not doing nothing. The Japanese Japanese government and businesses and big techs justifies not to doing doing nothing referring to the u.s so so um we have to say that say no the u.s is under the lina khan chairman uh, chairpersonship now right so that's what's taking place in east asia um i think <laughs> right so inaction can also be a, a um, inspiration for non-legislating I don't see any other comments or questions, and I think people are keen to get some air and some coffee. So thank you all three very much for your interventions. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll continue later. Thank you. Bye-bye.